Fathers and brothers, my name is Howard Wheeler. I'm a member of the Mississippi Valley Presbytery. I'm pastor of the Pottsville Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church in Pottsville, Arkansas. Also pastor and church planter, along with my brother James Ritchie at the River City Reformed Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Tonight, the uh, moderator has asked me to uh, continue the theme that, that uh, others have begun, advancing the gospel, but my particular topic is advancing the gospel through assurance. So take your Bibles this evening, if you will, and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, and we'll be reading verses 5 through 19, and then also verse 28. Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, and we'll be reading beginning in verse 5. But before we do that, we recognize that this is God's word given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through chosen men of old. And that not only is it inspired of God, but we require that work of illumination by the Holy Spirit to give us understanding. So let's take a minute and pray and ask God to help us with that. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. You are not a God who is hidden away in obscurity. You are a God who has revealed yourself. You are the revealer of mysteries, and most importantly, the great mystery of the gospel. So, Father, we pray that you would reveal that to us tonight, that it would be as the balm of Gilead. For we come before you a broken and weary and perhaps fearful people, men called to lead your flock as pastors and elders. But, Father, men, we admit, who are often fearful. And so we pray that you would comfort us by your word, that you would strengthen us by your word, you would encourage us by your word, and most of all, that you would show us the beauties, the riches of your Son, the Lord Jesus. So do this now by your Holy Spirit, we ask, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they ask him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. And then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. And then verse 28. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Thus ends the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. May he add his blessing to it. He was literally a young man on the edge. He knew in his heart, in his mind, in his will that he needed to advance. He needed to take the next step. A step that would either be glorious but could be tragic. Yet he was unable to move. He was paralyzed by fear, frozen in place. His whole body was shaking, tears streaming down his face, turmoil raging within him. It was a rite of passage. Others had done it. He must do it. But no rationale, no counting to three, 
No sibling rivalry loosed the grip of fear. Gravity in that square foot of the side of the pool was infinite. The heights were dizzying, the depths unfathomable. And nothing below would hold him up once he had jumped, not even his water wings. Nothing that is except the grasp of his father. His father's presence, his strength and assurance was the only thing that made sense in that moment. And that was the thing to which he jumped. You can do it. I am here. I will catch you. I will not let you sink. Look to me. Jump to me. The power, the character, the promises of the father was what gave him the assurance to take that step. Fear has power to paralyze us, to freeze us in place, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It incapacitates and prevents us from moving forward. Now, the Apostle Paul, in the well-known passage, says that uh, when I became a man, I put away childish things. And perhaps you've put away this childish fear. Perhaps jumping into the shallow end of the pool is not what you fear. Perhaps... What might lurk under your bed in the dark is not what you fear. But we as adults have put away childish fears, but we have our own fears, don't we? A fear of change or of not changing. A fear of not being accepted, of not measuring up, of not being recognized or valued. Of financial uncertainty. Of losing our edge, our abilities, our independence. A fear of fading away, unremembered a fear of not being known or loved or cared for, a fear of prolonged sickness, suffering, and yes, even death, a fear that everything that we believe is secure will become insecure. How many of you, every time you go to fill up your car, suddenly are seized with panic these days as it was 20 cents higher today than it was yesterday? Where will it end? What will that bring to bear? What is going on in our world? and a fear that God may take more than he gives. And as pastors and elders, we have a particular set of fears, don't we? The fear of confronting those in our church that will be painful to confront, whether it's a, a, one who's an influencer or one who's an authority or one who's in rebellion against God. The fear of being discovered as a sinful man myself who struggles with sanctification, with limitations, or perhaps our families that have struggles or difficulties. A fear, brothers, of our families growing to despise the church that we serve because she takes more time than they do, or perhaps because the church represents a revolving door for the friends of our children. A fear of struggling to preach, a fear of the baseless but unanswerable criticisms that we all endure as pastors and elders. A fear of being the pastor who presided over a declining church. What fear paralyzes you, keeps you stuck in place, unable to step out, unable to move forward in trusting in Christ and following him and, and leading his people and shepherding his people? It is no small thing to follow Christ Lord Jesus, in the Gospel of Luke earlier, tells us that if any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Bonhoeffer famously says that if Christ bids a man to come, he bids him to come and to die. It can be terrifying to follow Christ. Time and time again in the Scripture, we have the imperative, fear not. It is common in Scripture, sometimes as a rebuke, sometimes as a comfort, always as an imperative as a command. How do we obey that? How do we wrestle with that when we know that we are not in control? If you came here tonight and you were laboring under the delusion that you were in control of anything in your life, let me disabuse you of that notion. You are not in control, not of your circumstances, not of any person in your life. And we see the same struggle in the lives of the men in Scripture. Jesus' disciples were fearful men. They struggled. They struggled. They feared the storms. They, steer, they feared the Pharisees. They feared insignificance. They feared service. Peter feared two servant girls in the Gospel of John. Thomas feared false hope. 
Sometimes they fear Jesus, and so do we. Yet God gave them a faith that turned the world upside down. Remember what was said of the Apostle Paul. Those men who have turned the world upside down have now come here. Oh, that the people in your community would say that of you. Those who have turned the world upside down are now here. God grants us that faith. We know that faith is a gift. It is not something that we work up or cultivate or develop, but it's something he gives us. And in the week before going to the cross, Jesus gives his disciples great assurance so that fear would not paralyze them as he gives them a great commission. Local guys, fishermen who'd probably never been 100 miles from their house, yet he's going to tell them, go and make disciples of all nations. That is intimidating. And even when they come to the mountain to which Jesus had told them, come, what does the scripture tell us? They worshiped him, but some doubted. But Jesus gave them assurance so that that fear would not paralyze them, would not keep them from taking that step, that would not keep them from advancing the gospel. This passage is filled with what could be, for many, a robust catalog of fear. Wars and rumors of wars, tumults, pestilences, famines, all the things that we have in our world today that we live with every day. Crises of all kinds, church crises in the synagogue, civil crises as, as our brothers from Canada have, have told us about their trials and, and we will see more of that in our own country, beloved. And not only that, but interpersonal conflicts within families. How many of you have extended family who are not believers and, and when you go to that family gathering and that celebration and you begin to talk about the things of Christ, there's resistance and, and uh, friction. And so this could be a catalog of fears, but it is not. It is a catalog, a robust catalog of assurance. And Jesus sets it for, for, before his disciples and for us as well. Now, ultimately, our assurance derives from our union with Christ by faith. I appreciate uh, one of the other brothers who has preached before me who made that point, that point very clearly. I believe it was our former moderator. One of the uh, reformers, Melanchthon, though, was uh, noted for saying that to know Christ is to know his benefits. Our assurance derives from him, but he gives us assurance in several different ways in this passage that I want us to see tonight. And I'm, I'm going to give you those points, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the context of the passage, and then we're going to come back to those points as we walk through the exposition of the passage. But here, here are the ways, the four different ways, and this is not an exhaustive list by any means, that I believe Jesus grants assurance for us in this passage. First of all, Jesus gives preparation for what we fear. Second, Jesus gives purpose to what we fear. Thirdly, Jesus gives power to overcome what we fear. And finally, Jesus gives promises for victory over what we fear. This is assurance we need. I don't know how you arrived here in Bon Clarkin this week. I've had conversations with many of you, and I know that you have been in various kinds of struggles in your pastoral ministry, in your family life, in your personal life. And all of us probably have fears that we're dealing with that, that threaten to paralyze us. Find comfort. I, I pray that this passage grants comfort and encouragement and strength to you. But first, what's the context for this passage? So Jesus is, is giving assurance, but it sure doesn't seem like that at the outset. He's, he's coming out of the temple on Tuesday evening. And he makes a point, if you go back and look in Matthew chapter 23, uh, uh, the beginning of a parallel passage there of the Olivet Discourse, he, he makes the comment, behold, I leave your house desolate. And Jesus will never enter into that temple again, that, that human temple, that temple made with hands. He leaves that place on Tuesday night and will not come back into that temple. And it's a good reminder, beloved, that no edifice, no matter how delightful or, or filled with activities or programs, if Jesus is not there, it is desolate. And that word doesn't just mean empty. It means destroyed. It means void of purpose, hopeless, a ruin. He leaves the house desolate. And that's a shocking thing. 
I mean, the temple is, a, is one of the wonders of the ancient world. Its size is prescribed in the law. But Herod, in order to make his mark on the ancient world, uh, to give legitimacy to his rule, he enlarges the courts around the temple in a prodigious way. Uh, these noble stones that uh, the disciples mention here and the offerings that are there. The stones, some of those stones were told were up to 100 tons of solid white marble, very elaborate. Perhaps you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to the Western Wailing Wall and you've seen these stones that are still there. Amazing, so solid. If you built your house with that, no tornado is going to blow it over. No storm is going to even going to even cause a dent to it. And these offerings that it was adorned with were elaborate. There was a, a gold vine that, that encompassed the top of the temple, large enough for a man to stand in. It was, uh, it was the most secure thing in their world. And Jesus says, it's all going to come down. Not one stone will be left upon another. Like the men of Jeremiah's day, the men of Jesus' day believe the temple inviolable as long as it stands. We can live in any way we want, and God's promises are to us. Remember the people of Jeremiah who cried out, the temple, the temple. And Jeremiah said, go to Shiloh and see what God has done. It's not about the temple. In fact, the true temple is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? John tells us that. Even the secular authors of the ancient world, Tacitus tells us that the, the temple of Herod was immensely opulent. Inconceivable that it would be destroyed. And so they come and ask this question. And we find in the Gospels that different groups ask this same question. The Jewish leaders, uh, various people that are there around Jesus and his disciples, both privately and publicly, come and ask, when will these things be? What will be the signs that we will see? And so Jesus responds to that question. But he doesn't answer it in the way that they want. Because the win of these things is not someday, but every day for the follower of Jesus Christ. It's not something that's later, but it's something that's now. They wanted a... I used to work for Walmart years ago as a software engineer before entering the ministry. And Walmart wants to, to have just-in-time distribution centers where... The truck enters one side of the warehouse and uh, it immediately loads the truck on the other side of the warehouse. They don't want to spend any time storing that. And the disciples wanted a just-in-time answer. They wanted to know, when's this going to happen so we can avoid it? You see that theme throughout this passage of, of avoiding the crisis, of avoiding the frowning providence of God, of avoiding persecution, of avoiding the opportunity to proclaim the gospel faithfully. And so they, they want to know when it's going to happen so we can be prepared to escape it. And Jesus said, it's, it's not a someday, it's an everyday for the follower, for my follower. You see, in the Christian life, tribulation is unavoidable. Paul says in, in uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, that we enter the kingdom of God through tribulation. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We're told also in the pastoral epistles that if anyone desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he will be persecuted. The, the, the exit is not from, but through. So Jesus goes on to answer the question that they should have asked. Not, not when, but how. How can the gospel advance in the face of such opposition? How can we live by faith and not by fear? And so... I want us to look at those four different points of application for a moment. First of all, Jesus gives preparation for what we fear. You know, one of the ways in which we calm someone's fears is to help them understand what's ahead of them. We, uh, we want to prepare our children, don't we? We want to prepare them for the challenges and the storms of life that are ahead of them. So we teach them and instruct them. We want to prepare them to understand that, that the whole purpose, the sum of their life is to glorify God and to enjoy him. So we teach them the catechism. Preparation is one of the great ways and the great gifts that God gives us to prepare us for what's ahead so that we know honestly. And the scripture is brutally honest about what it looks like to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a nightmare that I have, it, and, and uh, it's, it's uh, where I suddenly realize that I was registered for a class. I'm back in college. Uh, some of you are nodding. You've had this nightmare. I don't think, I don't think hallucinations are generally not uh, corporate, but... Uh, <laughs> 
you know, you have this class. You suddenly realize you're registered. It's the last day. It's the final exam. You don't even have the book. You've never been to class. You have no idea what's going to be in the exam, and you're really concerned about your GPA. This is, this is my anxiety dream. I hope it's not yours, but it, it's a nightmare because I'm not prepared. So Jesus prepares the disciples, and he does that through a series of statements of imperatives. And uh, I want us to look at those. And as we look at those, we're going to see a lot of uh, hints of the other things that Jesus gives us to deal with assurance. So there's, uh, there's so, so fear not. It's going to take us a little bit to get through this first point, but, but fear not. First of all, he says, see to it, right? Uh, see to it that you're not deceived. There in verse 8. And that uh, just before he even gets to the command, the, the call is to be vigilant, to be attentive. Brothers, don't live your life in pastoring and shepherding and as a follower of Jesus Christ, just bumping along through the days, wondering what might happen today. Be vigilant. We are called to be disciplined in in our spiritual disciplines and in our Christian life. To be attentive. To fix our eyes. To not relax our gaze. To not allow our gaze to wonder. Oftentimes when we are fearful, we will follow whatever we hope is true not what is necessarily true. We need to be vigilant. We need to keep the word of God before us. We need to fix our eye on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as we see him revealed to us in the Gospels, and as we come to him through the means of grace. You see, to to lack vigilance is to look for something that may bring us relief, but not necessarily peace. And those are not the same thing. 1 Corinthians 16 is a very... Powerful verse. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and act like men. See to it that you aren't deceived. Don't be deceived by false teachers. Who is a false teacher in this passage? The one who says, I have the timeline. I know when it's going to happen. I know how to help you avoid the crisis. Here's the gospel of health and wealth and prosperity and and ease. Don't follow that nasty gospel of the cross, of, of taking up a cross. I mean, that's That's a lie from the pit of hell, isn't it? Isn't that the temptation that Satan brought to Christ himself? There's another way. Don't be deceived by false teachers who claim to have the timeline, who who claim to say, I am he. And what does that mean? It's the same language that Jesus uses when he claims that he is, in fact, God. Ego am he. And uh, so don't don't listen to those who, who come with another gospel. What did Paul say? Let them be accursed. If I or an angel from heaven comes with another gospel, let them be accursed. Now, most of us would say, well, I'm not going to follow after that kind of preacher. I'm not going to follow after that kind of teaching. I'm not going to follow after that kind of theology. I'm not starting a doomsday cult, or I haven't become a desert prepper. Well, maybe some of us have, but um, I'm not going to be deceived. It's interesting, the word here, deceived, to be led astray, quite literally means to wander. It's the word from which we get our word planet. I don't know if you're up early in the morning, but if you're up early in the morning, before the sun comes up, and it's a clear day, and you have a nice vista to the east, and you look, you'll see four different planets. You'll see Venus low, you'll see Jupiter, you'll see Mars, you'll see Saturn. And uh, just a few weeks ago, some of those planets were very close together. Back in April, there was a what we call a conjunction between Venus and Jupiter, spectacular. The the second and third brightest objects in the sky, and they're close together. Now they're not close together. Well, they don't stay in the same places in the sky. They're wandering stars. That's why the Greeks named them planets. And that's the root of the word here. It means to wander off. So we're probably not going to follow the desert prepper, and we most of us didn't fall for Harold Camping's routine years ago and plan for the world to end in October of whatever year it was, 2008, I think. But are we wandering off? What false Christ promise us peace? Maybe the false Christ of relevance. We live in a woke world. Some of you are afraid of wokeness in your culture and in your congregation. Because you don't know how to respond to it. It makes us anxious. Apologetics is a whole different ballgame these days. In the, in the world of identity politics and identity, identifying as this or that or the other thing. Maybe it would be easy to appease, to give ground to relevance, to love people as they want, not as they need. Maybe we seek other worldly saviors, politicians, 
Oh, if only this political party can get in power, or only this political party can be out of power. That's not the source of our salvation, beloved. There's only one king that rules and reigns forever and who's our, in whom our hope is, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But we seek sometimes worldly saviors, co-belligerents. Remember what Schaefer said, uh, we need to know the difference between an ally and a co-belligerent. There are many people who, who maybe seek the same policies that we would like to see enacted, but they don't come at it from the same reason. How do we wander away? Maybe we lose confidence, brothers, in the ordinary means of grace. Our church is declining. We, maybe we need something new. Bump and jumps on Sunday morning would really be an excellent way to start the service instead of the call to worship. Instead of the ordinary means of grace that God has given us, we must never lose confidence in the means of grace that God has given us. How easy it is to do that. I, I remember years ago and in reading the statement of Thomas Chalmers, who uh, he made this comment about the preaching of moralism in that day. Do you, have, you, have you been tempted to preach moralism? To preach do better, do more? To, to have five ways you can be a better this or, a le, or, a, or deal with that? I mean, sure, the Bible addresses that, but every week, beloved, you must be preaching the gospel. You must be calling people to come to faith in Christ. Chalmers said this, he said the preaching of the moderates, who were the, the moralistic preachers of his day, it was like a winter's day, short, clear, and cold. The brevity is good. The clarity is better. But the coldness is fatal, for moonlight preaching ripens no harvest. Are we tempted to preach moonlight preaching, not to preach the gospel, not to, not to have confidence in the means of grace? It is the gospel that has power to save men. Ralph Erskine, when he was a student, uh, he would go, like many men of his age, hear different preachers, and he would make notes. Uh, and we have his notes. And he listened to one preacher. He didn't tell us who it was. That was a grace for the preacher. But he said, uh, sermon not very good. And what was his assessment? Why was it a not very good sermon? No word of Christ. Are you preaching Christ? Are you trusting in the ordinary means of grace or have we wandered into other ways to, to draw a crowd, to attract? Don't wander and don't fear. That's the next thing that Jesus uh, gives us for preparation. Uh, he says, do not be terrified. And uh, that phrase there, there in verse 9, there's a lot of words for fear in the Bible. There, there's the word from which we get our word phobia. We understand that. That's very common. Now, phobia is something particular. Uh, maybe you, like me, like uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. And uh, Charlie Brown's feeling down. He doesn't really understand the true meaning of Christmas. He goes to Lucy, and that was a bad plan because it cost him to get bad advice. And uh, she goes through all the possible phobias he could have, a fear that's very particular. But that's not the word here. The word here is an unusual word used only a couple of times in the New Testament, and particularly in the Gospel of Luke. And it means a settled sense of dread. A settled sense of dread. How many of us have this abiding fear in our lives? That we are overwhelmed, that, that uh, we have come to nothing, that our, that our ministry is failing, that, uh, that we don't know what to do next. This abiding sense of fear. You know, it seems like the world is out of control, coming undone, but it's not. We believe in God's providence, that he governs all of his creatures and all their actions. The things that uh, we're warned not to be terrified of here, of, of pestilence. How many, how many of you dealt with a terror of pestilence? We have, we've had actions of synod dealing with the outflow of the terror of pestilence that have been a result of the last few years of all of our lives. I mean, your congregations have been terrified by pestilence, terrified by war, terrified by the crisis, the natural disasters, things that are always with us. We need to not have that settled fear. We need to remember that God rules and reigns, that all things are ordained by his sovereign and gracious purpose. We need not to live in fear, not to pastor in fear. Do you do that? Do you pastor in fear? Or is that characteristic of your ministry? Is your church a rainy day church? You know, well, we're saving for a rainy day. It's raining. It's raining. 
The fields are widened to harvest. What are we waiting for? Or are we like a circled wagon church where we're going we're gonna to round up the wagons and we're going to defend ourselves against the culture? Are we playing defense? We are to, to go forth. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to go, not to sit back and wait and to receive and to defend. Sure, there's a role for apologetics. But uh, are we terrified? Are we terrified of the world in which God has placed us, the world around us? You know, the, the, word, the, the terror here really is of things that unbelievers are terrified of. There's, there's kind of a picture here that reminds us of what life is like for the one who has no hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. They may say they're fine. They may say they don't need that. They may put out the hand and hold us off. But their life is a state of terror. And we are not to be terrified. We have a mighty and a gracious and a sovereign God. And then what else does Jesus warn us of? Don't squander your opportunity. Look at verses 13 and 14. All these things... Nations rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, various places, famines, pestilences, all those things which, remember, are the catalog of the judgments of God everywhere in Scripture. Uh, Persecutions by the church, by the state, by family. And then how does Jesus characterize them? These are your opportunity. Matthew Henry Uh, says this as he always says things in such a lovely way that uh, what a that at that moment the ones who are your enemies who hate the gospel the most become your hearers George Whitfield when he went to visit the uh, associate Presbyterians in Scotland you may remember there was the great controversy and And uh, some of the uh, associates only wanted him to preach in the churches of the associate church and not in the church of the moderates. And and Whitfield said, if Satan himself gave me a pulpit, I would go and preach Christ there. Don't squander your opportunity. When I was uh, first out of college and in school, uh, I had to take one of these professional development classes. You know, I was a software support engineer, but we had to take these professional development classes. Winning through customer service was the title. It was like roses and chocolates and unicorns. And the, the, the theme of the class was, there are no problems, only opportunities. It was corny all day long, but it's so true. <laughs> it is so true, especially for us in the gospel ministry. God places us in adversity graciously to bring the frowning and the smiling providence. In the midst of trial, the gospel light shines most brightly in our testimony and in our actions. Your crisis is not only known by God, but it is planned by God, brothers. There is no waste in God's economy. The gratuitous evil of the theodicist is a lie. He ordains whatsoever comes to pass according to the counsel of his own will for his own glory. So don't go looking for trouble. Don't lie awake at night thinking how to deter it, to avoid it, to escape it. Because if the Lord brings it into your life, it is for your good and his glory and for the grace of his kingdom and his people. And so we're warned. The, real, the warning here is don't meditate beforehand about what you're going to say. Now, that is not a license for lazy preachers. It is not a license to say, well, Mr. Moderator, you gave me a passage tonight, but I'm just going to pop into the pulpit and see what happens. That kind of language belonged to Aaron. Remember back in the Old Testament, uh, Moses comes down and says, Aaron, what have you done? And he said, well, I just took the gold, threw it in the oven, and it calf popped out. It's not a license for lazy preachers. It's not, a, it's not a, a warning against apologetics either. We are to be well prepared to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a legal and a technical term that says don't, requ- don't practice a dance or don't craft an argument to avoid a situation. Do we spend more time trying to get out of opportunities to share the gospel than preparing ourselves to proclaim the gospel in them? 
That's really the point. So don't squander your opportunity. Paul, at the end of Acts, the book of Acts is an exposition of this whole passage, by the way, in a very remarkable way. But at the end of the book of Acts, where's Paul? He's, he's like in house arrest. But he has this opportunity, he has access to Caesar's household, to the imperial guards. Uh, someone alluded to that earlier in Philippians 1. And it says at the end of the, gospel, of the book of Acts that Paul, in prison, proclaims the gospel with openness unhindered. We must see our crisis rightly so that we may respond to it faithfully. Don't squander your opportunities and don't give up. That's the last of the imperatives that Jesus gives us under the first heading of preparation. Again, fear not. We're, we're, we're moving rapidly through the text. How many of us just give up? We get frustrated. You're burned out. You're tired. I'm not going to ask you. It's a rhetorical question. How many of you are tired who are in the ministry? Every last one of you would raise your hand if you'd be honest tonight. Uh, one of my elders, uh, a dearly beloved elder who's... Uh, very old now, but he, uh, he told me when I was called to the church there in Pottsville, he said, church work is the hardest work ever. And he knew what he was talking about. And sometimes we're tempted to give up. Our, our own sin seems so great. Our struggle, our, our power, our strength seems so small. Our failure so spectacular. Our effectiveness so low. But you are not, brothers, in a position to evaluate your effectiveness. I, I'm very thankful for Drew's illustration of John Owen, the unknown country preacher who preached. And, uh, and in that sermon, John Owen heard powerfully. I, the text, I believe, was Matthew 8, 26, uh, in response to, to the disciples being fearful uh, on the Sea of Galilee. And, and I think the text was, why are you so afraid? Is your faith so small? And I appreciate what Dr. Ferguson once said. He said, it is God's gracious providence that we don't know the name of that preacher to remind us that whether our names are known or not, it is the word of God that has power in the lives of our hearers. You are God's man. God has placed you wherever you are. Don't think, I have no influence here. I have no effect here. You are not in position to know that. How many pastors have have led one person to faith in Christ, and that one person went on to lead thousands to faith in Christ. Don't give up. Bear up. Abide. Remain steadfast. Remember Epaphras who was wrestling in prayer? It was The word wrestling there in Ephesians chapter 4 is the word that we get our word agony from. He agonized. Sometimes ministry is like that. It is agonizing. Don't give up. Remember Jacob at Peniel? What a great word for us. He's wrestling with the angel all night long. And the angel says, let me go. What does Jacob say? I will not let you go until you bless me. Hold fast, brothers. Don't give up. Don't give up on the sheep. Yes, they bite. Remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. He, he looks and he sees the crowd. They were helpless and harassed as sheep without a shepherd. And he looks at these desperate, broken people. He doesn't see a graveyard. He sees a harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would thrust out workers into his harvest field, for the, the fields are white unto harvest. Don't give up. Don't give up. So that's the preparation. So let me quickly look at these other three points that, that we have in this verse. First of all, Jesus gives us purpose for what we fear. And we, we've seen this already. We've talked about this. He talks about the opportunity that we have. Jesus takes the crisis and makes it a platform. How willing are you to be put into a crisis in order to have a platform? How willing are you to spend two years in a Turkish prison so that you can come before the world and proclaim, I am not here for any reason other than to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ? We know that story. Our brother was in that situation. How willing are you? to be in that situation or, or will we plan a way to get out of that or to avoid that how willing are we to endure the crisis for the sake of speaking the gospel with openness unhindered you see the goal is not to avoid the crisis at all costs but is to speak Christ faithfully in the midst of it 
Are you going to have a crisis? Yes, Jesus says, all will hate you for my sake. That all means all. All will hate you for my sake. Think about the full implications of that. The people that you trust the most, the people that you think will always support you, you will be shocked at the crisis that arises when they hate you for Christ's sake. Jesus gives purpose for what we fear. It's interesting, the word there, opportunity, is, is from a word which means to turn. God takes the crisis and turns it for his glory. It's, it's a linguistic connection back to Genesis 50. Remember when uh, the rest of Jacob's son, Jacob dies and Jacob's sons come to, to uh, Joseph and they're like, our dad said before he died, treat us nicely. And Joseph said, look, what you meant was meant for evil, but God turned it, meant it for good. Jesus gives purpose to what we fear, and he gives power to overcome what we fear. Notice what he says, I will give you a mind and a mouth. Now, in, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, the parallel passages, uh, we see that uh, it's not Jesus per se, but the Holy Spirit. There's no contradiction there. Our, our God is a triune God. One God in three persons forever. And we find oftentimes that what Jesus says in, in, in the Gospel of John, and another comfort, I, the Father will send another comforter, and another, there's, a, there's an implicit comparison there. Owen himself says that uh, the Holy Spirit fills up the place in our lives that the, that the person of Jesus filled up in the lives of the disciples. And oftentimes the New Testament speaks of Christ as the, or the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. So Jesus says, I will give you a mind and a mouth. The power of the Holy Spirit, he places within us. And uh, we find uh, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is called the power. Right, and the word is the word from which we get our word dynamite. What resists the power of dynamite? Now in Arkansas, we like to have fun. And so when holidays come around, uh, people will take Tannerite and they'll set it up somewhere and they'll shoot it with their guns, whatever caliber they have handy, and they always have plenty handy, and it blows up. It's like a giant bomb. Dynamite's more powerful than Tannerite. What resists its power? And even more powerful is, is the Holy Spirit. It has the power to raise you from the death of sins and transgressions, my beloved. It has power. Who can resist it? God gives you that, why would you, why would you not exercise it? Jesus says no one will be able to withstand you. And it's a mathematical certainty that Luke 21 comes after Luke 20. And in Luke 20, we see Jesus being uh, attacked from every angle. The different groups come, they try to trap him. Jesus, because this, this is the question that always kills a politician, right? Should we pay taxes or not? And Jesus says, bring me a coin. Whose picture's on it? Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. And then another group comes and they have the uh, 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 seven husbands for one wife scenario. And, and Jesus recognizes the problem and he tells them, you are in error. You don't know the scriptures or the power of God. And then, he's, and then they come and say, by what authority do you do all this? And Jesus said, hey, let me ask you a question first. And you know, we, we talked about this just yesterday. They, about John's baptism. And they come back and say, well, we don't know. And Jesus says, neither will I answer you. And, they, and it says in the text, they finally just quit asking him questions. This is the same Jesus that gives you a, a mind and a mouth. That, that language of that passage harkens back to Exodus 3. When Moses comes to the burning bush, Moses, who 40 years earlier wanted to be the great deliverer, went out on his own, he failed miserably. He goes 40 years uh, herding sheep, comes to the burning bush, and now God appears to him and calls him, and he's nothing but excuses. I don't speak very well. Who made your mouth, Moses? I will give you a mind and a mouth. And Moses goes down, a fugitive, a slave, a, pe a, a leader of a, a slave people, he goes, I, I, what, what power, what influence does he have in his own self against Pharaoh. But yet he speaks powerfully, the mind and the mouth that God had given him. And millions of Hebrew slaves are delivered. Beloved, the people in your life are in a much greater slavery than any slave in Egypt ever was. 
They are in bondage to sin and to death. And you have the power of the gospel to bring freedom to them. And finally, Jesus gives promises for victory over what we fear. All these things, we need not fear these things. These are the things that unbelievers must fear, but we don't fear them. The end of the persecution, it may be death. Notice what he says there. In, uh, You'll be hated by all. Some of you will be put to death. And we think, wait a second, that doesn't sound a whole lot like victory. I was hoping for a different kind of victory. But beloved, what is more victorious for the believer in Jesus Christ than to enter into eternity? To behold the face of your Savior. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing is more victorious than the death of a believer. And while we don't want to hasten it, we don't fear it either. Even if the gospel brings our death, it promises great victory. But it seems contradictory because Jesus goes on to say, not a hair of your head will perish. But everywhere we find that language in scripture, it's, it's not speaking of a, some guarantee of physical protection, a reminder of God's sovereignty. No matter what comes to pass, we are in his hand. Martin Luther, when he appears before the Diet of Worms, uh, Stolpitz comes to him and says, Martin, where will you be? Where will you be? Where will your platform be if they, if they put you uh, to death? If they silence you? Just recant so you'll have con- ability to continue on. And Luther says, I will be then as now in the hand of God. It's a great promise. Not a hair of your head will perish. Nothing will happen to you that is not God's sovereign, gracious purpose for you, beloved child of God. And by your endurance, you will gain your lives. It seems like you lose everything for the gospel, but you gain everything for the gospel. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. What paralyzes you? What keeps you stuck in place, unable to move forward in following Christ, unable to proclaim Christ, to lead Christ's people? Christ gives us preparation. He gives us purpose. He gives us power and promises. More than that, he gives us himself. He is the one who comes as our redemption. We read in Romans that God did not withhold from us his only son, but gave him up for us all, that he will give us all things in him. And Ephesians tells us that we... Uh, have every blessing in the heavenly realms, every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. To know Christ is to know his benefits. Do you know him? If not, you have a lot to fear. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, fear not. Matthew chapter 28, very last verse of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells them, gives them that great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. But what's the assurance? I mean, it's a pretty tall command, fearful command. But Jesus says, but lo, I am with you each and every one of the days. You see, our assurance is to know him and to rest in him. I appreciate uh, the Randy Newman's discussion the other night and his allusion to the movie Apollo 13, and uh, I was able to hear Gene Cran speak one time. What a remarkable time when they're waiting for the capsule to re-enter, and you know, the threat of final disaster on that otherwise totally disastrous mission is there's uncertainty, and all the engineers are are you know they're nervous as cats. And Cran says, "Gentlemen, I believe this will be our finest hour." There's a lot to fear in our culture, in our world. But we have been given the gospel to proclaim boldly. This is our finest hour. Do not fear. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your goodness to us in Christ, for this word of assurance, for your kindness. To speak this word to to those of us who are fearful, who are, are struggling, who are weary, Father. You are the one who tells us to come and that you will give us rest and Father, if there are brothers here tonight that, uh, that have never come to you, and I pray, Father, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would grant them faith and repentance. 
in the Lord Jesus Christ and draw them to yourself. And Father, if there are those who have not fixed their eyes on you, not looked to you, not trusted in you, not rested in you, give them that rest tonight. Make us bold. Give us that assurance. Settle it in the deep places of our heart that we might fear not, that we might be bold, that this might be our finest hour in the gospel. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thankful that uh, Pastor Wheeler asked me to lead in a song this evening. It's a hymn, it's very old, that John Newton wrote. It was rewritten. The tune was redone by Matthew Smith. I